Okay, so hello and a warm, warm welcome to today's IS Entity Connect session. Um, joining you here, uh, we're broadcasting live from London here. Uh, my name's Cameron Rafiq. I'm one of the co-founders and communications director here at the International Society for Neglected Tropical Diseases. Uh, we have a very special session today uh, looking at uh, mycetoma uh, from the, through the lens of open science, uh, also looking at the actual pipeline that the open science um, effort uh, has uh, kind of yielded, and also looking at the kind of horizons for treatments and uh, diagnostics. And joining us today, we have um, Professor Ed Zilstra from the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative, the DNDI. He's joining us actually all the way from Malawi actually today. So that'd be interesting and, and, and very kind of him to make time to, to join us today. We also have uh, Dr. Wendy van der Sande from Ur Erasmus uh, University joining us in terms of the diagnostics effort uh, for mycetoma. And also Professor Matthew Todd, the Chair for Drug Discovery at University College London, based at the School of Pharmacy in Brunswick Square. Um, so it's going to be an interesting session today. Um, mycetoma, for those of you who don't know, is one of the newest uh, entrants um, additions to the uh, WHO NTD list of diseases. I think it was added in 2018 following quite a bit of advocacy and uh, work by various groups across the world. It's a chronic, progressively destructive infectious disease. It kind of affects the subcutaneous tissues, muscle, bone, and skin. Um, the causative agents, uh, bacterial or fungal, um, and the kind of areas in which it occurs in, the, the kind of the mycetoma belt, tropical and subtropical kind of uh, regions. And the, the interesting characterization or the interesting kind of uh, common part of that belt really is that short rainy seasons and prolonged dry seasons seem to favor the growth of uh, a kind of thorny bush, which kind of then leads to this inoculation by you know scratching inoculation by the uh, causative agent the fungal or the bacterial agent global burden in terms of disease burden is not known there are gaps there um, it is an endemic disease uh, there's been a lot of focus in sudan as an example and i'm sure that the speakers are going to go into and, and open up the uh, gaps and, and the knowledge gaps in terms of what needs to be done uh, in terms of getting to the proper um, estimate of uh, global disease burden. The, the kind of outcomes from mycetoma are very heavily focused in terms of the, uh, the psychological damage, the, 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 the stigmatization, the socioeconomic consequences, and not only for the patients, but the communities that they're part of. And in fact, also the, the kind of the stresses placed upon those already limited health services in terms of elmic settings or rural settings. So there's a lot to kind of get into uh, with today's session. So we thought we'd kind of uh, hand the floor over to the first speaker, Professor Ed Zilstra. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to speak about uh, treatment options uh, for mycetoma that are on the horizon. So before we uh, go into treatment, perhaps a, a quick uh, uh, overview of, uh, of EPI and, uh, and clinical presentation. This is um, a map on the right uh, right hand side at the top, which shows the, the classical mycetoma belt as we, as we knew it, between latitude 30 degrees north and 15 degrees south. And some time ago, Wendy from the Sander actually made a new map based on uh, what she could find in the, in the literature in terms of published cases. And the darker it gets, the more number of cases uh, were reported from that particular area. And Sudan is there right in the middle. Uh, it's probably one of the most endemic countries, followed by Senegal and West Africa, Mexico in the, in the Americas, and, uh, and India in the, in the East. But also in South America, Brazil and Argentina um, have reported quite a number of cases. Next slide, please. So it does matter where you look at look at in terms of is there uh, actinomycetoma or eumycetoma, which are the agents that are most common. And this is again Wendy's work. Um, the blue bars actually um, depict nocardia. So that means that actinomycetoma by nocardia is very common in Mexico and also in Brazil. And when we go to the next slide, 
in Africa, for example, of Sudan, you look at the brown bar, the Madurana mycetoma, this is by far the most common agent. So there, you mycetoma uh, plays a prominent role. And if you go further east to India, the slide, please, then we see a much more mixed picture. Next slide, please. So mycetoma, the clinical triad is there is a subcutaneous swelling, there is sinus formation, and there is discharge of fungal grains from those sinuses. So it's basically a chronic infection of subcutaneous tissues. And when the only mentioned, there's a tinomycetoma with a whole list of causative agents, and you mycetoma, the fungal type, also with a, a whole list of agents that can cause that. Next slide, please. Basically, the, the presentation from a clinical point of view can be quite similar um, in terms of uh, uh, the natural history. Actinomycetoma seems to be more aggressive, and of course, you treat it with antibiotics. Eumycetoma has a somewhat slower progression, and it has a different treatment with antifungals. Next slide, please. So, in summary, the characteristics of eumycetoma versus actinomycetoma. Eumycetoma fungi, mainly Africa, and you treat it with antifungals, usually with surgery. And there is a lot of experience in the literature about, the literature about treatment with catechomazole. But catechomazole, as you may know now, has been banned by the FDA and also the EMA some years ago because of its liver toxicity and adrenal gland toxicity. Uh, so that actually leaves us with intracomazole as the only drug available in many low and middle income country settings. And that has a cure rate, as far as we can tell from published data, of not more than 40%. So that's very, very disappointing. Basically, that means that eumycetoma is virtually untreatable. Actinomycetoma, on the other hand, caused by bacteria, common in the Americas, treated with antibiotics, usually with cotrimoxazole. If it is severe, it's combined with amikacin in cycles of, uh, of, of uh, several months. And in, in, in important literature, it says that uh, after two or three cycles, most patients can be cured and the public cure rate in Mexico, for example, is more than 90%. So quite different for you, Mycetoma. Next slide, please. So how do you get it? Um, I think because you get a, it is an implantation uh, uh, disease. You get it from a thorn prick here in, in Sudan, for example. If you uh, step on, a, on one of these big uh, acacia thorns, then through that bound, the uh, uh, the fungus may uh, may enter your skin and develop in a, uh, in a in a mycetoma mass, and many people do not wear shoes, so they, of course they are at ex extra risk for these minor injuries. And where the actually the fungus is, we don't know. Is it in the soil, or is it in the uh, animal dung? Because as you see in the right hand side, animals are kept in the compounds, and there's lots of dung everywhere. This question is still to, to be resolved. Next slide, please. So tra transmission uh, gives a mycetoma lesion often on the foot, but not exclusively. Uh, also other parts of the body can be affected. Um, in Sudan, for example, you'll see exam an example of those boys uh, not wearing shoes and you're at risk of uh, developing this grotesque uh, uh, lesion on the foot, which causes uh, uh, a misery over months, if not years, and uh, cause, uh, you know, so social uh, stigmatization. In Mexico, for example, uh, there are other varieties. There are, for example, in those who carry these bundles of wood on their backs, they may get pricked by that, and the mycetoma develops on the back. And in India, another common uh, variety has been described in, in tea leaf pluckers uh, with mycetoma lesions on the head. Next slide, please. So, uh, so how do you get it? We, we are not quite sure. Um, is it indeed animal dung in which the, the fungus uh, occurs and, um, and enters the soil? And after the uh, skin uh, perforation, it enters the, the foot of the, of the victim. Uh, we're not quite sure. There is 
mycetoma in humans, of course, that's what we're talking about. There's all mycetoma in animals, goats, cows, um, hamsters, many other uh, species. So it remains to be seen if there is a relationship between animal and human uh, mycetoma. Are they caused by the, the, uh, the same agents? And is there perhaps, you know, um, reason to think of a one health uh, type of problem with animals playing a role in the transmission to humans? These are scientific questions that are currently not uh, solved yet. Next slide, please. So what drugs do we have to, uh, to, to treat EU mycetoma? I'll focus on EU mycetoma because that is the biggest problem. And um, when we did this literature survey some time ago, um, basically there are all cases and case reports and next slide. There are no randomized study. This was the situation in, uh, in 2016. And the only group drugs we could choose from were the azoles. Ethicals are no longer available, leaves us with ITRA, it doesn't work very well. And the other ASL, like 4D and POSA and the um, they, they work in vitro, but they all have their limitations for use in LMICs because they're expensive. Some need therapeutic drug, drug monitoring or do not have a proper mode of administration. So there was, there's not much to choose from. Next slide, please. Repurposing of drugs, phosphoraficonazole is also azole, and it was developed by the Isai company in Japan some time ago, broad spectrum antifungal, and developed as a treatment for anicomycosis, and it is registered in Japan for that uh, indication. Uh, Isai and DNDI entered in a partnership uh, to explore phosphoraficonazole in a treatment of Chagas disease, and later uh, uh, in terms of looking uh, at mycetoma, because phosphoraficonazole has potential advantages over ITRA. It is, has higher activity in vitro. It is uh, dosed only once a week rather than twice per day, so a big advantage. Uh, the diet does not affect absorption, whereas in the case of ITRA, that is the case. And it is a weak inhibitor of liver enzymes, so less likely to be toxic and have drug, uh, drug interactions. Next slide, please. So the NDI has started this randomized double-blinded proof of concept phase two superiority clinical trial some years ago. And the aim is to deliver an effective, safe, and affordable new drug. And we do that in a partnership with ESI in, uh, in Japan. And the study is, uh, 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 takes place at the Mashatoma Research Center in Khartoum, Sudan with uh, Professor Ahmed Fahal as the PI, and the study is funded uh, by uh, GHIT in uh, Japan. So the study population involves primary mycetoma caused by Madurella mycetomatis, the most common agent in Sudan. We focus on this agent in this study, smaller size lesions, and age cut off uh, 15 years. So the study has three arms, a higher dose of FOS, three milligrams weekly, a lower dose of FOS, 2 milligrams weekly, and the comparator arm, um, itoconazole, 400 milligrams daily. After six months, everybody gets surgery, the remaining lesion is removed, and then follows another six months of drug treatment until 12 months the end of treatment. Uh, this study is still ongoing, and we expect to have the results uh, early next year. Next slide, please. So just to point out, this is a monocenter study in Khartoum in the Mycetoma Research Center. Tremendous expertise has been accumulated by Professor Ahmed Fahal and his team over the years. And I just want to highlight this because if you have you know, a particular problem in terms of managing your patients, don't hesitate to contact them because uh, they have tremendous expertise and experience. Next slide, please. Other drugs that could be repurposed, naclosamide has been published in the literature. We know it from Sisto. We know it as a broad spectrum antimintic for tapeworms and flukes. Um, and it is noteworthy that it is, uh, poorly, it is poorly absorbed, but there is a new formulation that um, actually makes it better absorbable 
an ethanol amine salt um, that has been developed. And it has been tested, and very interesting, for Motorola mycetomatis, okay. MIC slightly higher than interconsol, okay. But it also has activity against actinomadura in vitro. And actinomadura is an agent of actinomycetoma. And the MRCs are much lower than cotrimoxazol. Remember, this is the first line drug in, in actino in many places. So are we dealing here with an agent that potentially could be developed in the treatment for both actina and human mycetoma? Question mark. Very interesting. It needs to be developed further. Next slide, please. There are new drugs on the horizons. And not only the azoles, but we have other classes to choose from. Hopefully. It, for azoles, we now have suba itraconazole, super bioavailability itraconazole. It is less dependent on, on food and gastric pH for its absorption, so it's better, it has better availability. Then the polyanes, the, uh, the amphotericin B, for example, there are at least two oral formulations developed. That, that are, there are probably many more, but I just want to mention these two the encochleated one, and another one is lipid-based self-emulsifying, and that has been published, and it is tropically stable, very important uh, to, to, to be used in the, on the tropical conditions, and it is already in phase one or two studies. And uh, uh, it's also promised to be inexpensive, inexpensive, so that is certainly something to keep in mind. Other classes of drugs, um, olorofin, very promising, it targets, it targets the pyrimidin synthesis. It has been tested in vitro, as you can see in the lower part of the slide, with the, uh, the black bars representing itraconazole and the white bars um, lorofim. And um, uh, it is certainly in vitro, is, uh, is very promising. Fosmanogepix or manogepix, that is the active compound, is a GPI inhibitor. I mean, all these drugs act at some point on the cell wall, as indicated in the, at the, on the right-hand uh, top. Um, and this is an, an, an uh, antifungal drug uh, already in phase two uh, trials for invasive fungal infections. And we know that it has activity against Schizosporium, Lamentospora, and others. So it could be interesting to be de developed for uh, for eumycetoma. Ibrexafungurp is a terpenoid. It's a glucan synthesis inhibitor, also in phase two, phase three studies for invasive fungal infections. Also some evidence that it could work against eumycetoma agents. So another promising developing uh, development. Next slide, please. Then there is the CIN um, 102 compound by the Septius company, a completely different uh, class of drugs. It is a, in fact, a synthetic oil you see the, the chemical composition on the left side, left lower side of the, of the slide. It is an antimicrobial and it also has an indirect effect, it's an anti-inflammatory effect. And that could be very promising, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Wendy has test, tested this in the lab, in vitro, active against the myelomasotomatis, in vivo, low concentration, prolonged survival of the cholera model. So again, this is also a compound that uh, we should keep an eye on. Next slide, please. What other options do we have? This is, it is you know, one case report, but I think it is very interesting because this is uh, about one patient who was actually scheduled to have his leg amputated because nothing works. For the conazole, or the conazole, Flucytosine, you name it, uh, for years and years and years, nothing worked. And then he was scheduled for an amputation. And he got diclofenac, uh, so as you know, that is an NSAID for palliation. And that had a dramatic effect. After two months of treatment, the clinical explanation was normal, so the mycetoma was gone. Ten months, treatment was stopped. And eight years later, follow up, there was no recurrence. So this suggests that an inflammatory agent in itself could have an effect on mycetoma. Come back to that uh, later. Next slide, please. 
This is a completely new uh, other, other approach, also very interesting, also about the patients who, were, who were, was about to have his leg amputated because nothing worked. And he was treated with implantation of beads, beads impregnated with amphotericin B. And in the, in the middle, uh, you see the, uh, the, the at the beginning of the operation that the black grains are there. And after cleaning the, the wound, um, these uh, implantable beads were put in, the lesion was closed, and these beads are bioabsorbable. bioabsorbable and um, this uh, resulted in cure of this patient. So another very interesting alternative option. Next slide, please. So then, yeah, we need to observe the clinical spin of your mycetoma so images from the Myotoma Research Center in Khartoum because uh, it starts with a small lesion and then develops into something worse. And uh, in the left lower side is a sort of uh, myotoma lesion as we as we know it. And then there's a patient who had several amputations of the leg and again a recurrence in the, in the remaining part of the uh, the, uh, the upper leg. And then in the right lower lower side patient with infiltration of the abdominal tissues and uh, uh, that patient is obvious on surgery and that then it becomes very complicated. So is there one treatment for all these, uh, these stages or should we uh, uh, have tailored uh, approaches to each stadium of disease? Probably the latter is uh, the best approach. Next slide please. So what are the challenges in terms of treatment regimens? What can we think of? I think the priority should be to shorten the duration of treatment. Of course, that's easier said than done. Now it's often more than 12 months. And this is because lack of response, because drugs that do not work are not available, uh, poor compliance, poor access, all these issues. But that should be the priority. Then the time of surgery, the approach varies in endemic areas. On average, smaller lesions are often you know, subject to wide excision. Moderate lesions first treated with then the full then surge and then and some fungus are continued. But that could lead to, uh, to actually nice encapsulation of the lesion as you can see on the, on the slide. But um, these black dots, these black, black dots represent the fungus that is still there and it cultures you can culture it from the from the specimen, so that means that yes, it, you can nicely uh, uh, take it out by surgery, but um, the chance of recurrence is uh, is high. And if you have very large lesions, it, it varies. When you look in the literature, there are some groups who uh, would advocate to do first debulking, in the uh, hopefully that the uh, uh, antifungals would have uh, would to a better response. Than and the size and size of the lesion, I've shown you the spectrum, so it probably there's no one, uh, one size fits all. And we should take into account, is there bone involvement, yes or no? Is the lymph node spread, yes or no? And other complications. So what is the best treatment regimen then? Is it monotherapy? Can we manage? Or should we go for combo, combination therapy? You know, and this is nothing new, of course, because we are using combination therapy for many other indications. We have managed to shorten it to the duration of TB treatment, of leprosy treatment, or rhizomyces treatment by using combination uh, approach. So that probably is the way forward. Should we go for the induction and continuation, perhaps with a parenteral drug that could be injected, and then continuation with a monotherapy or combination? All these issues that uh, can, can be explored. And then what about bacterial superinfections? These sites are open in uh, open uh, communication between the the outside and the inside of the of the mycetoma lesions. There is secondary bacterial infection. Should everybody be treated? If so, with what and for how long? Um, this is all uh, needs to be discussed. And then lastly, we have not addressed addressed at all indications for pediatric uh, treatment. Um, in the literature, you'll find often that groups are mentioned in age group between 11 uh, to 20 years, that she could be up to 30% of all mycetoma cases in certain endemic areas. So we need to look at, uh, at pediatric 
uh, groups well. Next slide, please. So, okay, good treatments, that's one thing, but we need a tool to monitor our treatment uh, to be sure that the, the lead has gone and that the fungus has gone. And Wendy has already mentioned that she's working on beta diglucan, and hopefully that over time can be adapted to be used as biomarker. Ultrasound, there's a lot of experience in Sudan again with ultrasound. On the upper part of the, the slide, you see the uh, the images of Eumacytoma with uh, uh, small and sharp hyperechoic uh, grains indicated by arrows, typical for Eumacytoma. And the lower part uh, uh, shows a much more hazy aggregation of, uh, of uh, grains, typical for, um, for Actinomycetoma. So as a diagnostic tool, there's a lot of experience with that. And whether we could use that this as a uh, test of cure um, is probably uh, worth uh, exploring for. And then three dimensional scanning, uh, very promising. You can see an example of, uh, of a scan on the, on the slide and uh, the color, the difference in colors shows you the, uh, the number, the, the, the distance between the normal skin and the top of the lesion. So the blue is more or less level and the red is uh, the, the, the points that are highest elevated among the, the baseline level. And with these 3D scans, you can measure the circumference, the diameter, and also the volume of the lesion, at least as far as it is uh, on, uh, uh, on top of the skin. And perhaps you can actually develop it into a, a reliable biomarker because it is field adapted. Uh, you can scan everybody everywhere and we need, just need to, to show that it, it could be used for that indication. So that's ongoing work. Next slide. Collection of strains, I think Wendy mentioned it already, very important. We are not restricted by medullary acetomatis. We need much more information. Understanding of immune responses, or, uh, what type of information is going on and what can we do to influence that very important, I think, to, to understand these processes. An animal model, very important. Um, the Galeria model is very easy as a screening tool, but the mouse model is much more uh, closer to what we see in humans because it's an innate and adapted immune response. And then pharmacogenomics, because we're treating patients you know, in, in various parts of the world, and we need to be sure that the drug levels in all these different patients groups are are adequate. Next slide, please. So, and the next one, please. DNDI is focused on uh, the clinical uh, um, uh, proof of concept trial for Fosca That is the priority. And again, these results hopefully will be available early next year. And hopefully we can actually continue with registration of the drug and uh, develop an access program. And that will be a tremendous achievement in itself. And the, the other, um, other um, things that I wrote on the slide are basically derived from the things we have discussed so far. So for the short term, you know, the way forward could be, and it is open for everybody to comment, to explore these new fungals, uh, monotherapy, combination therapy, induction continuation. Collect as much strains as we can from everywhere, typing, resistance, from medium -term, term studies with combination therapy and immunological studies, and include all endemic areas. And for the long term, uh, R&D for uh, new chemical uh, uh, entities, the MySetos uh, program where Matt will talk about soon, and not to forget natural compounds. There are lots of natural compounds that seem to be promising, uh, at least to do work, to work in vitro for uh, mycetoma. So hopefully in the long term, um, there could be you know, combined chemo and immunotherapy, and we have a reliable point of care test and a biomarker. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, definitely uh, the landscape for human mycetoma treatment is changing. There are new options on the horizon. 
and we need to do more drug studies in all endemic areas. So far, the only clinical trial is, the, is being carried out in Sudan. We need much more work. And the priority, this is my personal opinion, should be to try and shorten treatment regimens. And the best way to do it is perhaps to, to use combination of drugs. And hopefully we can do this in a joint approach with actinomycetoma, with focus on drug discovery and development, focus on diagnostics, and focus on understanding pathophysiology, particularly the immune responses. Next slide. So with, the, with that, I would like to thank the donors who are supporting our mycetoma pro, uh, program. And next slide, I would like to thank you for listening. Thank you very much. There was a wonderful presentation in terms of not just the overview, but this whole, the horizons that are opening up in terms of what we need short term, mid term, long term. Uh, some very interesting discussion points, I think, opening up there for the uh, Q&A. So thank you very, very much for that. I was really thinking about the one health uh, gap, if you want to call it that, in terms of, uh, you, met, you alluded to that in, earlier in your slide. I wonder how that approach, and we'll come to that, I'm sure in the Q&A, could accelerate um, all of this research in the right direction. Um, and I'll, I'm definitely going to be asking a couple of questions that have popped into my mind regarding that. Uh, so thank you very, very much for making time. I can only imagine you're very tired because you went from Rotterdam to Kenya, you explained, and from there to Malawi. So, you know, a huge thank you uh, for, for that. Superb. Some great um, comments coming through already from the audience. Um, Dr. Ikram Guizani, I believe, Ikram, you're in the Tunisian Institute Pasteur. I think that's saying excellent. If I've got that wrong, forgive me, but that's great. Excellent. Um, we've also got uh, joining us um, Kat Gulias, the head of communications at the NNN a huge uh, organization in terms of all the NGOs that are involved, probably uh, touching into some of the uh, stigma points um, uh, raised there earlier, at least at the community level, the NGOs that are out there. So it's good to see you there, Kat. Thank you for joining us. From Nigeria, uh, Dr. Oyun Kansola Fajdi for joining us. Hi there, good uh, day to you. Um, we've got Dr. Dmitry Melikov joining us from the Mycetoma Research Group at UCL. So. Uh, close to here, actually, uh, down, down the road. Um, Bertrand, Dr. Bertrand Noyagonge, joining us from the Mycetoma Research Group at Erasmus um, University in Rotterdam. Um, that's not, yeah, brilliant. That, that's great. Super. Great to see you there. Thank you. We've had a couple of questions coming through as well, which we will definitely come to in the Q&A. So thank you to Dr. Sarah Mohammed from the uh, Ministry of Health in Sudan for that question. And, um, you know, please don't be shy. These sessions, I've written that, are really, we are really trying to bring people together and have an open feel to this and a collegiate feel. It's only made possible by interaction. So no, uh, don't be shy, no wallflowers. We want to get involved. And as you've heard earlier, there's already a public consultation call to arms by the WHO, deadlines on the 29th. You know, there is this feeling there that people need to get involved in this and kind of, and that's what we're trying to push that ethos into this session as well. So thank you very, very much for that, Ed. I think Matt's just joined us there as well. So hi there, Matt. And so now we'd like to move on to our second speaker, Dr. Wendy van der Sand, who's Associate Professor in the Department of Medical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases at the Erasmus MC University in the Netherlands. Building on what's been presented by Ed, Wendy will be speaking to us in more detail about what's coming through in the pipeline for mycetoma diagnostics. Wendy, over to you. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the introduction. My name is Wendy van der Sande. I'm an associate professor at Erasmus University. And uh, the day, today I will present uh, the mycetoma diagnostic, what's in the pipeline. A short introduction. Mycetoma is a chronic subcutaneous disease characterized by the discharge of grains and purulent material through sinuses. And actually, it's simply, uh, simply grasping when, you, uh, when I explain how this disease occurs. So people usually walk barefoot in the endemic regions, and then a minor trauma, such as a thorn prick, can introduce the causative agent into the sole of the foot. And that can be either a bacteria or a fungus. Inside the foot, it will form protective structures called grains. 
and where the fungus or bacteria is residing, and a small nodule on the sole of the foot will occur. This all is painless, so people don't experience pain, and usually, therefore, they don't seek medical attention when there's only a small wound. However, this wound will start to grow, as you can see here, and in real life, it looks like this. The microorganism can even invade the bone and destroy the bone, as you can see over here, where cavities are formed by the causative agents. While well, mycetoma, unlike other infectious diseases, can be caused by many different causative agents. Um, if the causative agent is a bacteria, we speak of actinomycetoma. When the causative agent is a fungus, we speak of eumycetoma. And if we look worldwide, the most common causative agent is the fungus Marjorella mycetomatus, which is found in more than 40% of cases and forms black grains. This one is followed worldwide by Nocardia brasiliensis in almost 20% of the cases and white grains are formed. And then Streptomyces somaliensis, Actinomadura maduriae and Actinomadura pellitrae are found. The second most common fungal causative agent worldwide is the fungus Falciformis spora senegalensis, which also forms black grains. As I mentioned, mycetoma has a worldwide prevalence but the distribution of the causative agent is not equal. So if we look in this small map, we see that Mexico, Sudan and India are very prevalent uh, countries where many cases are reported from. But if we look, for instance, in Mexico, we see that there's hardly any Majorella mycetomatus seen, no Streptomyces somaliensis octanomadura pellitrae, but the majority of cases is actually caused by the bacteria Nocardia uh, brasiliensis. However, if we go to Africa, we do see that uh, Majorella mycetomatis is very prevalent, but hardly no, any Nocardia brasiliensis is found. So you can imagine that although mycetoma is found worldwide, the causative agents found differ per region. And therefore, the uh, way the uh, mycetoma diagnosed also differed a little bit per region. And to make a more a consensus out of this, um, Professor Hay asked several experts of mycetoma around the globe, what would you do if you see a mycetoma patient and how would you diagnose? And the majority of these uh, experts actually said, well, first we would look at the patient clinically to see the lesions, and then we would take a punch or an incisional biopsy to obtain some grains, and the grains would be looked via a direct smear, via histology and cultured to identify the causative agent. The next step was to ask mycetoma experts, what would be the test you are actually missing right now and what would help you in establishing the mycetoma diagnosis? And to tackle this, uh, a group of experts uh, together with the World Health Organization uh, designed some target product profiles for the mycetoma diagnostics really needed by the experts in the field. And this is currently up and running, so the TPPs are up for consultation. And if you would like, you could uh, provide them some feedback. The deadline for feedback is the 29th of November. So the two TPPs developed for mycetoma so far are a test which can ident ideally identify the causative agent to the species level to initiate appropriate therapy, and a test which determines if a mycetoma patient on treatment is actually free of disease so that the treatment can be stopped. So if we look at the first TPP, a test identifying the causative agent to the species level, in the ideal situa situation, this test would identify any of the causative agents to the species level. But as mentioned before, there are more than 80 different causative agents, so this will be very challenging. But why is it important? Well, at the moment, actinomycetoma is treated with trimetoprim, sulfamethoxazole, and an other antibiotic, and that other antibiotic depends actually on the region where you are. And eumycetoma is always treated with itraconazole and surgery. But not all causative agents appear to be equally susceptible to these treatments given. So if we look at actinomycetoma over here, you can actually see that 
for already in the 90, in 1990, the Cardia Brasiliensis was very uh, susceptible towards this treatment, but already 13% of Actina Madeira Madeira isolates are actually resistant against trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. And since this is more than 30 years ago, I don't think that this percentage would have decreased by now. It's probably increased. For eumycetoma, we do know that most of the causative agents, such as Madrella mycetomatis and falciformis poracenegalensis, are very susceptible in vitro towards these drugs. But other causative agents, such as Metacopsis romeroi and Madrella uh, fahali, they cannot be inhibited by more than 16 microgram per mil. And that's a concentration which you cannot attain in serum. So therefore, ideally, you would be able to say if mycetoma is caused by either of these causative agents. However, since the majority of the causative agents is still susceptible towards the treatment given, the minimal requirement would be to differentiate at least between bacterial and fungal causative agents so that you could start the appropriate therapy. So antibiotics for bacterial mycetoma, itraconsole and surgery for fungal mycetoma. So if we look back at the tests uh, recommended and used by the experts, we have the direct smear, histology and culture. Well, direct smear can differentiate between bacteria and fungi, and it can do it immediately after taking the biopsy. So you crush the grains and look under the microscope to see if you see fungal filaments or bacterial filaments. With histology, a more appropriate diagnosis can be obtained because you can visualize the grains and you, the uh, appearance of these grains can already give an indication to the causative agent. But usually it cannot identify to the species level. Culture uh, allows identification to the species level. But as you can see over here, that takes more than six weeks before the final identification can be given. And that's a very long time when you have a patient waiting for therapy. But is culture by itself reliable enough? Remember, there were more than 80 different causative agents. So already in 2008, Quintana et al. published that you really need molecular identification to differentiate between Streptomyces sumaliensis and Sudanensis. In 2012, the Hoge et al. published same for Madrella species. So molecular identification was needed to differentiate Madrella mycetomatis from Madrella fahali. And remember, Madrella fahali was resistant towards itraconazole. And if we go to the reference collections, like the one from Great Britain and the one from France, Actually, 22 out of 28 Trimetosphaeria griseae isolates was misidentified based on culture. When they performed molecular analysis, they appeared to be different causative agents of mycetoma, including some of the ones which appeared, appeared to be resistant. So culture probably is not enough to identify to the species level, and it takes a very long time. So what alternatives have been developed in the recent years? Well, first, we look at serology. For actinomycetoma, already in 1993, an in-house ELISA for uh, Nocardia brasiliensis has been developed and used in Mexico. And if you look at this picture, these are the um, results for mycetoma. So you get very high absorbances. The healthy controls are low, so you can really differentiate between the patients and the controls. And if we compare this with tuberculosis or leprosy patients, also those patients appear to be negative in this ELISA. So it seems to be a very good ELISA, although recently cross-reaction has been noted with Actina madura species. But this assay is currently still clinically in use. For you, mycetoma, we could measure beta um, but beta glucan can be found in every fungus, so it's not species-specific. And if we look at eumycetoma, we see high levels, we see low levels in the controls, but actually we also see some higher levels in actinomycetoma patients. Furthermore, there were specific antigens identified for Madrella mycetomatis, but again, cross-reaction occurred. So if we look at this antigen, fructose bisphosphate aldolase, we see very high antibody levels uh, against the mycetoma patients, but also high 
In the actinomycetoma patients, and if we look at the healthy controls, again, high levels were found. So these antigens were not able to differentiate clearly between healthy controls and patients. So therefore, none of these assays are currently in use. Serology is the only assay which can also provide some evidence for cure. So the in-house ELISA for Nocardia brasiliensis can actually differentiate active patients from patients which were cured, as you can see on these observance val values. And reactivated disease was again associated with an elevated level of antibodies. For eumycetoma, we only have some preliminary data which indicate that maybe beta d glucan could be used to monitor therapeutic response, but further evaluations are needed for that. So next to ser uh, serology, what other alternatives have been developed? Well, one of the alternatives is MALDITOF, and MALDITOF is a technique which is available in many microbiology laboratories at the moment, and it's very frequently used. The only downside is that you really need to isolate. In mycetoma, that means that you have to wait six weeks before you can do your species identification. Secondly, the species also need to be present in the database. And if we look for the most common causative agents of mycetoma, actually only Nocardia brasiliensis is available in the database, not Majorella mycetomatis or Streptomyces somaliensis. And of course, we can add those to the database, as done here by Andy Bowman's group. And you can see that they can be actually uh, identified with MALDI. But still, you have to wait till you have your culture. And that takes six weeks. So probably MALDITOF is not the way to go if you want a rapid point of care test. So then the only alternative which is currently under development is molecular diagnostics. So the first requirement for molecular diagnostics is, of course, DNA. And in the past, we had to isolate DNA directly from cultured isolates. So again, this took six weeks before we could molecular identify. So therefore, in the first years, this was not clinically used. But only a few years ago, we actually developed a technique where we could isolate DNA directly from mycetoma grains. And that made this technique much more applicable in the clinical situation. Instead of waiting for weeks, within one or two days, you can actually know which causative agent is causing the mycetoma. And the second requirement is the amplification method. And techniques most often used to identify mycetoma causative agents is either amplifying barcoding genes and sequence or use species-specific PCRs. So if we look at the amplifying of the barcoding genes, we have barcoding genes for actinomycetoma and eumycetoma. For actinomycetoma, 16S and heat shock protein 65 are used. For eumycetoma, ITS. So what happens? We actually amplify the gene, then sequence it with Sanger sequencing, and then we compare the sequence with sequences known in the NCBI database or in the database of the Western Dyke Fungal Biodiversity Center. And then we can identify the causative agent. The pro of this technique is that it works not only with known causative agents, but it can also be used to identify novel causative agents. The downside is that you actually need the sequencer, and which is usually not available in endemic areas. So to circumvent that, there were genus-specific PCRs, so these PCRs can only identify to the genus level, so they can differentiate Nocardia species from Streptomyces species and Actinomadura species, and they have been there for Majorella and Scytosporium, but not for the other causative agents. And still then, you only know the genera, you don't know the uh, species on, its on itself. However, for species-specific PCRs, only species-specific PCRs have been developed for Majorella mycetomates and have been used. For most of the other causative agents, they are currently still under the development. So which PCRs have been used? For Majorella mycetomates, the most commonly and the oldest PCR is the one uh, developed by Ahmed et al. already in 1999. 
and it is based on the ITS region. It is currently the assay actually used in most endemic settings as well. The only downside is that it was developed in an era when the sibling species were unknown, so there were less species known to cause mycetoma at that time. Later on, it was um, found out that Majorella mycetomatis was not only Majorella mycetomatis, but also Majorella pseudomycetomatis for Hali and Tropicana are there. And this PCR did cross-react with Majorella pseudomycetomatis. But luckily, the resulting PCR product for Majorella mycetomatis is different for in size from that from Majorella pseudomycetomatis. So this PCR can still be used to differentiate the two. Due to this cross-reactivity, Limital already developed in 2020 a novel uh, PCR used uh, where the, and in that approach they used a comparative genomics approach. And they developed this when they knew the sibling species. And so far, no cross-reactivity has been observed with any known eumycetoma causative agent. And hopefully it stays this way, but we will only know that when we test all new newly discovered mycetoma causative agents in the future as well. But that's nice, having a species-specific PCR. But what if you don't have a thermocycler? So these assays also have been developed in isothermal platforms. So for Majorella mycetomatis, a lamp has been uh, developed, which is an isothermal amplification uh, method, which results in a bending pattern, which you can see in this uh, agro shell picture. And it was very specific because only Majorella reacted and none of the other causative agents. And an alternative method is recombinase polymerase amplification or RPA. And again, you see that it only reacted with Majorella mycetomatis and not with the other causative agents. And if you think, well, <coughs> it's nice to have an isothermal amplification method, but if you still need agarose gel to visualize, it's still not point of care. You actually can also visualize these PCR products by just adding a simple DNA dye, as you can see over here. So this one is positive and these are negative. And if we compare PCR with the isothermal uh, amplification methods, you can see that the thermocycler is needed for both PCRs and that it takes roughly six hours uh, to identify the causative agent, but only two hours for LAMP. <coughs> Sorry, and 40 minutes for RPA. So what should we develop in the future for mycetoma? Assays which can identify the causative agent, tools which can monitor the treatment in, uh, response, but most importantly, these assays should be rap rapid, they should be point of care and be useful everywhere, even in the field, and sustainable, so that they could be used every time you need them and not um, because there's a lack of funding and the essay is no longer available. So with that, I would like to conclude again to put some attention for the public consultation of the WHO. If you're interested in mycetoma diagnostic and you would like to help uh, move the field further, please look at this consultation and provide them with your feedback. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very, very much, Wendy, for a wonderful presentation there. Um, 80 different causative agents and the whole nuances and uh, challenges, really, in terms of trying to get to the right diagnostic. Uh, we really appreciate that. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of questions coming through from the audience alluding to this, you know, uh, your work, as well as this whole role of the global kind of community, as it were. You've kind of touched on that with this global call from the WHO. Uh, for people to get involved and help shape that the target product profiles and some very interesting points there so thank you very very much for that we put the poll up actually one of the slides that you'd shown earlier and you'd asked us to put this question to the audience um they're very kindly everybody's responding and we've keep we, we haven't ended the poll it's still there but if i'll just give you a quick uh just to see where we are with it now well if, if you with your permission we'll leave that till the end of the session and we can have a full so at, at this time point um, you asked, what diagnostic techniques do you use to identify the mycetoma causative agent in your laboratory? Um, no identification methods at all, 
So that's quite, so 18%. Um, the direct smear at the moment is, we just went down to 16%. Histology, 11%. Culture, 16%. And PCR, miles ahead at 36%. I wonder what the, the uh, effects of the stigma attached to the patients has in terms of them coming forward into clinics to give samples, if that has any interplay um, in these figures or the, or the types of kind of um, techniques used. And I'm sure we'll come to that in the, uh, the Q&A. But thank you very, very much, Wendy, for that. I just want to give a quick shout out to the audience. You go to many conferences and you sometimes you don't know who's there. You don't know, you know, what we love to see is the spread because we really enjoy that kind of uh, feel. Very encouraging. I'm just, just a quick shout out to some of these wonderful audience that have joined us. So good morning, afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. Uh, we said hello, but Philip, Dr. Philip Odaida from Kenya. We've got Dr. Sarah Mohammed from the uh, Federal Ministry of Health in Sudan. Assalamu alaikum, uh, Sarah, to you there. Good morning to you. Nick Rainier Santos, all the way from the Philippines, uh, from the University of the Philippines. I bet you're enjoying better weather than us, Nick, this morning. Collins on duty from Kenya. Uh, there, uh, we've um, we've got uh, Dr. Jonathan Steinhorst. Uh, from the University Medical Center in Groningen, the Netherlands. Uh, Dr. Monique Wasuna from the DNDI in Nairobi, Kenya. Hello there, Monique. I know you uh, put some Twitter out regarding this. We really appreciate that on social media earlier. Murder Nafs from the Foundation, the Netherlands Foundation for Global Dermatology. Um, Dr. Senyu Adini from the uh, Children's Hospital in Sokoto in Nigeria. Dr. Adini is really close to us because we're working uh, with MSF on an advocacy project for MoMA, actually a polymicrobial disease in the Sahel Belt, um, with a you know, big focal area there in, in Sokoto. I, I'm sure you guys will end up chatting with each other, a lot of similarities and lots of interesting kind of overlaps, I'm sure, from uh, the sample collection point from the patient's perspective. I'm sure he'll be, uh, uh, you will be involved in the uh, Q&A as well. Lynette, our team from the DNDI. So glad you could join us. I know there was some issue with the connection, so great. All the way from Brazil, Dr. Virginia Valims. Hi there to you. Uh, Dr. Mercy Mume from the DNDI Kenya. Our own Marianne here in London, the, the other co-founder. Wilson Lim from the Mycetoma Research Group in Erasmus. And uh, there's lots more to and I'll come through those in a second. Very interestingly, and I, I actually love this, we've got Dr. Paul McKeating, who's brought all his student body in from the C Seven Oaks School in the UK. So for us, advocacy is not just in the closed kind of circle. We want to get to the new generation and embed some of these uh, fundamental kind of ideas around these neglected tropical diseases to hopefully end the neglect at some point. To do that, we have to involve this younger generation. And I think that will speak volumes, I think, to the open source approaches that we'll come to later. But so glad you could make us uh, make this uh, and, and join with your school, uh, Dr. Paul McKeating. So thank you for that. We didn't know you were joining, but thank you for that. That's excellent. And that's a very neat segue, I think, into our final speaker for this session before we move to the Q&A, and that's Professor Matt Todd, uh, the Chair of Drug Discovery at University College London um, here in, in, uh, in, in Russell Square. Um, I think we'll hand the, the, the floor over to Ed, and just before we do, it's very nice to see you. This is now the age of Zoom and, and this webinar you know, systems that we've got in place. We had the pleasure of meeting Matt way back in, I think, 2015 or 2017, when you came all the way over from Sydney uh, as part of your open source malaria project. And you, you gave a wonderful kind of visionary, uh, if, if you don't mind me saying, um, talk on open science and uh, the, the impacts of that to malaria research. And that really struck in our mind uh, all that time. So we're absolutely delighted to know that you've moved back from Australia here in London and applying all that knowledge and all that experience, all that vision to Mycetoma. So absolutely delighted to have you on here. Um, and I'm going to hand over the floor uh, uh, to you now and I'm going to back out. So over to you. Thank you so much. Thanks for organizing the session. Really uh, great to, to um speak listen to uh, old colleagues and uh, meet new people and i guess that that's the point of the event which is fantastic because yes this is a disease that definitely needs input from everybody as a communal effort 
um, to solve uh, something pretty dreadful. It's interesting seeing some of those uh, photos of patients. Um, it, it's just a really shocking disease. Uh, I remember back in the, I, th I think it was the 2015 Basel meeting where I first met Ed, um, and I think I first met Wendy. Um, and I remember a talk being given by Professor Fahal, uh, and, and the room was full of people, and, and, but it was very quiet because I think everyone in the room was so sort of furious that there were, there were no medicines to treat this disease that was affecting these patients um, up on the slides that he was showing. Um, and the horrific nature of it. So it's, it's difficult viewing, but it's essential viewing, I think, to remind ourselves of just what we're dealing with here, um, where we don't really have good medicines for this disease yet. Um, you know, there, there's some essential and fantastic work being done by DNDI um, on the clinical trial with ESI. Um, and I, I didn't know what the design was of that trial, but just seeing that slide a second ago, it, it reminds you again that we're talking again about a 12 month um, trial period with surgery in the middle. You know, this is not something where you swallow a pill and it goes away. Um, it, it's a really difficult infection um, and, and lots of people uh, need better options. So I guess that is the you know day-to-day -day motivation of everything we're doing here. Um, and this Mycetos project, which I'm going to talk about briefly, it is an attempt to do something about discovering new inexpensive small molecules um, together. So you know, I think every academic in the world will will agree that collaboration is the key um, and that to solve a problem quickly, you just want to work with the best people uh, as, as quickly as possible to solve problems. That, that's what you do. So we collaborate. And that's the reason we do that. Um, and what shuts collaboration down and what makes science less efficient is if there happens to be a reason why we have to keep secrets. Um, and there are a few reasons why you might do that. But in drug discovery, the problem is we have to keep secrets because you have to patent things if you want to try and make your money back uh, or, or work in a for-profit environment. So, you know, the, the pharma industry has to take patents and has to be secretive um, in order to operate. But of course, we're dealing here with a neglected tropical disease where I think everyone acknowledges there is no money to be made um, in, in, uh, in drugs for this disease. We need them to help people. Um, but no one's going to make a profit here. And so that removes the need to, to keep secrets. And what that means is that you can, in that case, if you want to, uh, operate in a very open way, um, talking about what you're doing and sharing what you're doing as you're doing it. So um, when I talk about open source drug discovery, um, what I mean by that is, is not that we're doing a bunch of work in the lab and we're finishing a project and then we're, we're publishing it in an open access journal. I'm talking about uh, sharing the research live as it's going along uh, so that people can see what you're doing and get involved in the research as it's proceeding, uh, not after it's happened. I, I don't know about you, but when I was a, a junior scientist doing a PhD, I would often read papers where I would be very excited about the research that I heard about. Um, but I couldn't, you know, I read the paper and I thought, well, it's taken a few months for this to be written, a few more months to be published. I'm reading it a few months after it's been published. A year's gone by. I don't know what the team has done in the meantime. I don't know how to get involved in this research so that what I do is is up to date and is helpful. Um, you know, I, I may as well forget it because I, I may be doing something that someone's done already. And this open source idea applied to biomedical science is trying to get around that. It's trying to make sure that if you read what's happening about the project today, you you will know what's happening in the project and you're up to date. So your suggestions and your contributions will not be wasted and there will be no duplication of effort. So that's the reason why we're sharing things. So the general approach that we've used over the years, and, and we started this uh, you know, 15 years ago with a project on schistosomiasis, um, but more recently we, we scale it up to be a kind of drug discovery project for malaria with the medicines for malaria venture. Um, but what we're talking about here are projects that abide by these general rules um, with the, mo the three most important are that all data are open and all ideas are shared. So everything has to be online in real time. Um, anybody's allowed to participate. There's no, there's no hierarchy really. Um, and because it's all open, you have to get you know, used to the idea that there will not be any patents. We can't, you can't patent something retrospectively. Um, if, you, if you Google the phrase retrospective patents, you'll find a blog post by me and nothing else. Okay, So the, the, you can't do it, right? So some, something's in the public domain, you can't patent protect it, right? 
so that means you can't share it if you want to if you want to uh, if you want to uh, do an open approach. Okay, um, so those are the first three things, and then the other th the other three laws there are just about how to behave really. But what I'm talking about then is a project where you're working in a lab and you're doing research and you're sharing what you're doing in an electronic laboratory notebook, so no paper and pen, and you have that lab, lab book online so that people can read it um, without signing into anything. So Google can see everything. You know, it has to be very transparent, and everything goes there. Every, all your data has to go there. To coordinate things, you have to then work with people and, and try and collaborate online and um, have tasks that need to be done and so on. So we have um, a, a discussion and, and a sort of public to-do list on a, on a platform called GitHub, which is a, a software platform, but it has a really useful feature that allows people to collaborate very easily. And again, it's a very big, well-done system that is, is, is really quite stable and, and well-backed up. Sharing open data is, is easy with things like Google Sheets, uh, and we're exploring other ways of, of um, having data to do with all the compounds, the, the molecules that we're making in the project. But ultimately, you can share data very easily um, using, using things like Google Sheets. Um, and then back in the day when we started these projects, we had no really good way of reaching out to people. But in the last you know, 20 years, social media has been invented, and, and now it's quite easy to, to advertise what the, project, what the projects need. Um, and alert people to new developments. So over the years, we've been working on several several diseases in this way, malaria and TB, um, and, and of course, mycetoma, which is the mycetos project. Uh, and, and the openness has, has led to spontaneous inputs to the projects um, by well-qualified, talented people. So it's spontaneous. Um, and anybody who's done any software coding will, will tell you that this is what happens. Um, anyone who's a, who's a Wikipedia, um, uh, senior Wikipedia editor will tell you that, you know, things happen when you open up, you know, things, people come along and they contribute and they do things to advance the project. So we've had inputs uh, to all these projects over the years from, from student cohorts through to citizen scientists, through to senior executives in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, it's a very inclusive, anybody can take part. Uh, and, and it works. The openness stimulates this, this, these contributions from, from people around the world. So on, on the malaria side, the, thing, the kinds of work we're doing here uh, for, for drug discovery are starting with small molecule um, candidates in the public domain. So these ones, for example, came from screens by, by GlaxoSmithKline and Pfizer. And, and you take those and do hit to lead kind of projects where you're trying to improve the molecules. Um, you're making them, you're testing them, you're sharing all the data and you're trying to get everyone involved who wants to be involved. Um, so that's, that's been going for a while. Uh, just as one example, to give you an idea of what we're talking about here, early on in one of the malaria projects, we had these molecules that were needed for, for a particular uh, screen, sorry, for a particular uh, series in the malaria project. Um, and we put out, we needed them made and, and we couldn't make them in our lab. Uh, and so we put out this advert saying, we want these molecules uh, to be made. And, and, a, and a PhD student in, in um, Edinburgh decided that he wanted to make one because he knew, I think he knew how to do it. And he shared everything he was doing online and we could see the quality of the work because he was using a lab notebook so we could see that everything was clean and pure and well done um, and he ultimately made several compounds that were tested for the paper and became an author on the paper and, and operated completely independently of us so he was in scotland and we were in sydney um, and it just worked really well because because we were sharing everything uh, and, and about two years later, we met and, and had dinner and a, and a beer and stuff. But for the whole project, it was completely efficient, uh, even though we were separated by thousands of miles. And that's kind of the idea here is that because you're sharing, you, you can be anywhere uh, if you do it right. So over the years, I, I guess, we, you know, we've worked with several educational institutions, sort of junior student levels to, to crowdsource inputs of molecules. Um, this is a, this slide slightly out of date now, but, but these are some of the organizations that have contributed molecules to, to the malaria project. Um, again, you know, as part of uh, university and school initiatives uh, where people, instead of crystallizing benzoic acid or whatever, they, they make a new molecule. Um, and and we, we got a lot of press um, from this a few years ago where we worked with a, a, a school in Sydney. Um, so these, these are 17 and 18 year olds. Uh, with their teacher to, to make a, a molecule um, that had overnight become very expensive. So a molecule called Daraprim, which um, is used, uh, was used more to treat malaria and toxoplasmosis. Um, the rights have been bought by cheering pharmaceuticals and the price had been hiked and it was, uh, everyone was outraged. So we worked with the students as part of something called the Breaking Good Project in Sydney. 
for them to kind of re-engineer a patented approach to the molecule and make their own samples of it. And it caught the press because the student there is holding a, a, a sample of Darapin that's worth uh, $150,000 and they made it in their lab class. And it was beautiful synthesis. They did an amazing job. And, and this caught the attention because it was about pricing of drugs and how ridiculous the, the high prices of some drugs are, uh, given that the drug is not difficult to make. But ultimately for us, it was, it was to show that, you know, using a kind of open platform and, and where students have dedicated, talented teachers to guide them, they can do real research, in this case, making the molecule in a way that was not yet published. Um, so it was a wonderful project, uh, and, and we want to do more of this. Um, and I'll mention that again in a minute. So as an example of some of the sort of crowdsourcing synthesis that we've done, when crowdsourcing is always going to be a part of this, um, th this is a, one of the series from Malaria, uh, OSM, Open Source Malaria Series 4. Um, and th the synthesis is shown there, and there are bits of it that are done by research students who sort of demonstrate in the undergraduate labs, and then there are bits of it that are done by, by the students themselves in teams. Um, but the overall end point is that over the years, with cohorts of sort of 40 or 50 students at Sydney Uni, we've made uh, several molecules, several um, batches of molecules that have been evaluated for potency against the malaria parasite. Um, and the students really do a great job. Um, and it's unusual because they'll see these are first year undergraduate students uh, at university. And it's unusual, of course, because uh, the students don't know if the synthesis is going to work out. So, you know, if they, if they don't manage to make the molecule, how do you assess the, uh, the practical, you know, and how do you assess plagiarism when everybody can see exactly what everyone else is doing? So there are interesting educational things about this, but, but it definitely works. And one of the advantages of doing this in universities um, is that you have the lab already, you have demonstrators already, you have all the safety things taken care of. So you can get things done quite quickly. Uh, DNDI has done a bunch of this work on, on other projects um, as part of the Open Synthesis Network, for example. Uh, so it, do, it does really, really well if you get the right people in universities to champion these ideas. So we, uh, a few years ago, wanted to apply these ideas to uh, mycetoma. It seemed like an absolute no-brainer. There's a, there's a horrific disease with no medicines, no good medicines um, that, uh, that are available. And so we thought, well, let's try something. And so um, with all the, the deep expertise in the biology uh, that Wendy's has been talking about and Ed's has been talking about, we wanted to try and organize a, a sort of open source way of going after new, inexpensive, simple to make medicines that might be useful and to try and get people to collaborate very broadly on, on those uh, series so that we could be sure that everyone was kind of looking at the same things and no one was duplicating and everyone was learning from everybody else. Um, and so the, the first series that we looked at were, were these phenaromols that were identified during a previous campaign on an unrelated uh, infectious disease where um, a bunch of molecules have been made uh, through a collaboration between a company called Epichem in Australia and, uh, and DMDI. And so a screen was done, Wendy was doing a screen of these um, and identified several molecules that looked promising. And, and we played around with some of the chemistry and made some variations um, and, and found some things that were reasonably positive in this series, the so-called phenaromol series, which is the first series that we looked at for, for mycetos. Um, and we've been investigating these still. There, there were some early indications that some of these molecules suggested a trend that was quite interesting, that some molecules that were, that were performing well in vitro were not performing well in the in vivo model that Wendy runs um, using the moth larvae. And uh, whereas some of the molecules, so there was, a, there was a, a, apparently not a good correlation between in vitro and in vivo. And we noticed that there could be a, a slight correlation between the ability of a molecule to kill in vivo um, and its ability to penetrate the grain structure that we see uh, in, the, in the disease. And we thought that maybe this was something to do with the molecule's uh, log D value. So it's, it's uh, lipophilicity and whether or not that could penetrate that defense mechanism. I, I think, and, and this is live, right? So we, we're not yet sure. We think that the, the more recent data, which has been acquired through synthesis and further evaluation, is, slight, is suggesting that maybe a little bit less. But, but if you're interested in that kind of issue about uh, you know, the ability of molecules to penetrate structures made by, by infectious uh, organisms uh, in vivo, then, then please join the team because this is a, a sort of live issue. Um, and we'd love to know if there is really a correlation here about uh, molecule penetration and its in vivo effectiveness. And more recently, we've been working with a local school here in the UK, um, Seven Oaks School. I think Paul, Paul uh, was originally on the line. I'm not quite sure if he is anymore. The, um, the, uh, the, the school kids at Seven Oaks School 
have been working to try and make a, a phenomenon analog recently. Things have got way slowed down because of COVID, unfortunately, um, but the school is interested in, in carrying on working with us. And, and we're really hoping that we can, with, with some support from the Royal Society, to, uh, to really get them involved and maybe some other schools involved in, in, again, making new molecules as part of live drug discovery projects. So, you know, where, where the things that they do can actually make a difference and actually get involved in publishing real academic research. This is an example of one of the, the lab notebooks from way back when, when uh, the, the students from, uh, from Seven Oaks were, were making a, a molecule and were cooling a, um, a solution there. So, you know, the lab book really shows everything and you can put photos of what you're doing and, and tell people what you're doing today and you can tell your family about what you've been doing and so on. So it's a, a nice way of sharing the sort of detail of the science. Um, currently in Mycetos, there are um, about five series. There are little variants of each. Um, but, but this is the sort of general uh, state of affairs. So the phenormals were number one. Uh, number two, the aminothiazoles um, are, I think, an interesting looking target for, for the Seven Oaks team and for others because the synthesis is reasonably straightforward, pretty, a little bit simpler than phenormals. Um, and, and we do have tantalizing activity from, from those molecules. So if you're watching this, and you've got access to a lab or, or, you, or you run a lab class and you're thinking, well, maybe I could get some students involved in doing some chemistry, then series two might be for you. Um, some of the other molecules shown there are looking, are looking promising, but haven't, we haven't explored them terribly much yet. Um, we've, we've posted them as potential starting points for series and, uh, and, and they're all you know, live, but we, we're not pursuing them with a lot of chemistry yet, but we, we might in the, in the near future if we can you know, generate more resources for the project. The, the link at the bottom there is, is the generic site on GitHub, and you'll see that each series has its own site, and there are other things uh, there too um, about how the projects work and, and things like that. One of the nice things about this in terms of collaboration is that it, it injects an element of randomness in the collaboration. So um, normally when you collaborate in, in medicinal chemistry, you know, I, I as a professor would work with students. And then I would communicate with other professors and they would, they would work with their students. And it's all, it's all a bit limited in the sense that there are communication uh, uh, avenues there which are not being explored, which is, which is unfortunate. So the advantage of openness is, of course, that when the students can work together directly without the crusty old PIs like me getting in the way. So, so that peer-to-peer -peer interaction is usually more efficient. Uh, and so we see that a lot in, in open projects where students are talking to each other, professors and students are talking to each other. Um, it's, it's a free dialogue, uh, which is quite um, hierarchy free, uh, which, which helps science for sure. But, but beyond that, one of the things about the openness is that, you know, you have your project team and, and you work with you know, a group of 10 or 20 people or something. But, but anybody can come along and take part. If, if people see something they like and they want to get involved, they can because it's a, it's a free project. Um, so we often find people come to the project and get on board who were not people we knew already. Um, but are just interested in contributing. So it does it does really broaden out the kind of collaboration that you can do. So if you're watching this and you want to know how you get involved, well, um, I mean, make molecules. That would be the best thing. Start your own series. So if you've got a series of molecules uh, that you think are interesting, then you can start, you know, Mycetos Series 6 and own it and run it yourself. Um, no problem. Uh, we're, we're providing a platform and, and a sort of a set of guidelines about how to run things. But but if you want to run your own series, that would be absolutely fantastic. In terms of the Mycetos project now, uh, again, these links are to live issues. So there's a bunch of synthesis planning going on uh, for the aminothiazoles. What's going to be made? Who should make them? Um, what do we need to get that started? Um, and 7X is involved in that and the University of Sydney is involved in that. Um, we're also trying to understand the structure activity relationships of the first series of the series one phenaromals, because we need to publish that and we need to try to make sure that we've covered all of the SAR um, and we haven't missed chemical space, which we should obviously be looking at. Uh, and the first, sorry, the second paper on the, on the, um, on that phenaromal series is currently being written. Um, and, you know, the paper is being written online and anybody can get involved in helping with that too. If you are um, a, a sort of non-lab-based science student, or you know such students, um, and you think that people might be interested in getting involved in a sort of non-science non way, or certainly a non-lab way, then we definitely need student project champions who can come along and, and help with things like um, making sure that the websites are up to date in terms of where the project's at. So like a Wikipedia page, you, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a thing which is kept up to date by people constantly tinkering with it. 
And we need that for the Mycetos series so that when you come to the project and you read something about it, you are up to date. Um, we need help with that. We need help with organizing meetings and um, sort of minute taking and assigning actions to people and then chasing people to make sure they've done things uh, or things like that. You know, we need a lot of help with sort of running the project online so that it makes sense. If you're interested in that kind of thing, which is not lab based and not necessarily science based, but it's more to do with sort of project management, just uh, get in touch with me and I can guide you there uh, about what's needed and, and, and how to get involved. Very quickly at the end, I just don't want to deal with the one issue that people often um, uh, come up with about money, which is that uh, if you share everything, then how on earth can you um, expect to uh, fund that? Where's the money going to come from? If you can't make use of patents, what can you do? So what you want to do is have the thing on the left there, which is people working together um, freely, like, like you do when you're a kid and you play with things together and you just, you know, you, you have a good time, which is us doing this. <laughs> that's us doing the science, right? You're having a good time. And then you, you work on things and you want to make a pill without any, any secrecy, right? And then you want some way of making that sustainable. Now, there's lots of ways of doing this. DNDI are our leaders in this area. And sometimes uh, organizations like DNDI in collaboration with governments will fund things directly um, or they'll fund them in collaboration with companies in a non-for-profit basis. Um, so I can tell you all about that. Uh, and that's very powerful. There are, there are other possibilities too. One that we've been playing with has been the idea of using something called data exclusivity. Um, if you develop a drug uh, you can patent it. Well, we can't because we're open, but, but if you normally develop a drug, you, you can patent it. But separately from the patent, you also have another way of making money back, which is an exclusivity that you're given if you take a drug to market that protects you from generic competition. So it's a reward for having done the clinical trials is you get a period of time where you, you alone can sell the drug. And so we've been playing around with the idea of perhaps using that, which is already existing as a, as a mechanism for protecting a drug, um, to use that as a period where perhaps you could sell a drug at a rate that would make money back for any potential investor. Um, and it's an idea only. So there's, a, there's an article at the bottom of that slide that's, that, pub, that describes it in full, and I, I'd recommend you go there. It has a very interesting table in it, which lists a bunch of drugs. Um, the, the, the table goes on below the end of the slide, which are on the market and making money for the companies selling them, uh, which are not patented. Um, and which are making use of these market exclusivities to, to try to make money back, even though they're unpatented. So it could be a potential way of, 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 um, of uh, doing open source drug discovery in a way that is financially sustainable. No one's tried it yet, but it's an idea. We, we founded this company called M4ID Pharma um, last year to try and do this. And we, we don't have any projects yet. We're looking for projects to, to do this. And, but the idea is that it's a company doing open drug discovery where everything is shared um, and it's for profit and it's owned by a not-for-profit trust. So any profits that it make would go back to the trust. Um, and that's the idea that we would use exclusivities to, to do that. But it's a, it's a concept which we could apply to drug discovery and development for mycetoma um, as one possible solution. Like I said, there are, there are others as well that we could imagine. So working in an open way and doing all your R&D in an open way, you can still publish everything, um, you can work together on everything, and, and I'm pretty sure that you will be able to find an economically sustainable way to bring that open asset that isn't patented to market and to patients. Uh, just some quick thanks, uh, mainly to, um, to people who've uh, funded the, the mycetoma side of things, so, or, or worked on the mycetoma side of things, so DNDI, and of course, Wendy and her team, uh, and buried in there are a bunch of people that worked on the, on the mycetos project, such as Dimitri, who's on the line. Um, as well. And so they're kind of hidden in this cloud of people who've contributed to, to open projects over the years. So uh, thanks to all of them and, and thanks to you for your attention and thanks to Cameron to, for organizing this session. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think that was absolutely amazing. And uh, I think a round of applause, not just for that, which was we knew it was going to be an eye opener, uh, kind of amazing presentation because we, we're very aware of your work. Also a round of applause to Paul and the Seven Oaks Massive in terms of uh, that really, a really uh, inspirational uh, part of your presentation there. I know um, Paul's there with, his, with the Seven Oaks uh, student body as well as part of the audience. So a round of applause, I think, a real round of applause to everybody there. Amazing, absolutely amazing. And a lot of food for thought uh, moving forward. I think that's kind of, 
come to the end of the, the presentation session. We've got about a half an hour left in terms of the Q&A. We've had some questions coming through. Um, if I could ask the, yeah, if I could ask the presenters just to kindly put the videos and the, uh, and the, uh, the sounds back on, we'll just go straight into the Q&A. Okay. There was a constant theme throughout those presentations in terms of multi-sector or, you know, multidiscipline collaboration, partnership. It came again and again throughout the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, three presentations. It kind of echoes a lot. I know my Satoma is the earliest, uh, the new one, the newest entries to the WHO's own uh, NTD list. And one of their roadmap shifts is all about encouraging multi-sector, multi-discipline uh, partnerships. So I think the first question, I mean, that kind of comes down to definitions when we're talking about partnerships and communities. And one of the things I wanted to kind of tie that into was the, one of the gaps that was firstly, kind of, when are you at first in terms of your um, presentation on diagnostics? And one of was very apparent, uh, not just from the literature, but from your presentation, now, there's a huge gap when it comes to estimating the global disease burden. And obviously, you're, we're here talking about global communities and bringing people together. So I kind of wanted to really ask you, um, your diagnostic approach, you know, how do you, obviously, it's yielding data that's going to be uh, there absolutely fundamentally needed to, to correctly determine disease burden. What are your thoughts on the role of the global community in this? We're moving to integration. What, what are your views on it? Um, so we started a few years ago the global uh, mystoma working group. Um, this group is open to everybody with an interesting mycetoma. Um, we put on a Slack uh, where we communicate with each other. Um, and so uh, what we do is we help people setting up this, these diagnostics the primers, probes, we share everything. Um, and then people can work in their own lab and send things if they want some confirmatory basis. Like for instance, um, did we identify this one correctly? Then we really help people setting up their own diagnostic facilities in their lab. And we hope that this will spread further and further so that we get a really true estimation of the mycetoma burden worldwide and get a view of what the real causative agents are there worldwide. Uh, that's a fantastic answer. Um, there's an actual effort going on. In terms of this integration, I know you mentioned the, the WHO's uh, uh, call to, to um, for people to input into this TPP, but it's not just mycetoma they're talking about, they're talking about yours and they're talking about scabies as well. How do you see those type of partnerships is there room for you guys to to move together these, these patient groups you're talking about have probably come under the same they're in the same spheres of uh, you know what are your views on that yeah so typically um in the past there was for instance an intervention for jaws an intervention for brulee also or an intervention for chromoblastomycosis and then they saw all these patients with other entities and they were simply classified as other in their resulting papers now people are more aware that they, mm -hmm. these patients are seen by the same physicians um, so that we should share these data and should uh, work towards a more integrated approach. And that could be on diagnostics, but also on drug discovery, because mm -hmm. both are interlinked. Because if you can't identify properly in the field, you need to treat your disease, which can be brought, uh, could be treatable as broad as possible. Also, if you look at diseases like homoblastomycosis and mycetoma, both are fungal skin NTDs. Basically, they are fungi. So probably many of the drugs developed for mycetoma could also be repurposed for chromoblastomycosis and the other way around. So a more integrated approach yeah. um, helps both in drug discovery, in diagnostics, but also in disease burden. Uh, that's a great answer, actually. I was thinking about Noma, actually, with the, when, we were, when you were talking about polymicrobial uh, crossovers. Uh, but I was thinking about that. Maybe that could benefit from this. Just moving from, well, still staying within this uh, concept of multi-sectorial or partnership building and uh, bringing in Matt's kind of open uh, ethos, is it open science ethos, which is very clearly demonstrated there. Ed, you mentioned in one of your slides, you'd put 
the there's a potential gap in the understanding. Um, is this a one health issue? And I had a slide there alluding to. I sort of pick up on that for a second because there was another slide you mentioned where Wendy had you, you when you'd, you'd been involved in the mapping project in terms of mapping the belt, uh, some of the data within that, I suppose the spatial data within that. Mycetoma is obviously there's a when the short rainy seasons and prolonged dry seasons that seem to 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 at least in terms of the bushes that are, are able that are there in terms of the uh, entry point of the disease uh, through the feet or whatever uh, in terms of patient when it comes to that when it comes to this one health approach and I'll ask this to Ed do you feel that climate change that type of those type of data sets could be, or those uh, sectors could be brought into this somewhat. And I'm asking because you, you, we're talking about in, uh, ultimately generating enough evidence to make sure countries, governments are involved in this at policy level ult ultimately. Do you think there's room for that? And I'll ask that to Ed. Well, yeah, it's very, it's a very interesting point actually. The issue with mycetoma is that it is very slow to develop. And if there is any effect of climate change on the incidence of mycetoma, it will take it. It will be very difficult to demonstrate because it takes months, if not years, before people develop mycetoma and report to a health center. So it is quite different from uh, from uh, vector diseases, for, for example, that have a more acute mutation, such as dengue and white Nile and encephalitis and what have you. So it will be difficult to demonstrate. But, but your remark about your certain climate conditions that favor the development of mycetoma may change and actually may change in their own direction. Uh, it could also be, you know, be favorable if something, a certain area becomes much wetter. Uh, just to give an example, yeah. it may not be favorable for, for, for mycetoma. So uh, this is all, all speculation at this point. Yeah, I suppose I'm asking that because it's such a neglected part of the neglected disease spectrum that anything we can do to put, propel it upwards in terms of the global health yep. agenda, tying it into different agendas, like yep. through data, that, that type of approach, that's the kind of reason I'm asking. So the, yep. that's the, the kind of premise of the question. I'm sure as that one health interface starts to be better understood, it might start uh, generating evidence on that. Um, can, can I, can got, I, can, uh, um... Come on, can I um, take this one step further and uh, ask uh, Wendy, because Wendy has worked with a PhD student who actually looked into samples collected from uh, various sources. Wendy, which, which, are you able to summarize the latest information? Do we have samples from animals, humans that are exactly the same? Can we say that? Um, it's difficult to say. Um, most of our results are from stoma lesions from uh, Sudan. Um, we do see differences genotypically, so um, there are different strains of mycetoma causative agents. Uh, there's clinical variants. Uh, but if this will change over time and if this is different during time, it's difficult to say. The only thing if climate change would really uh, really be important um, is that maybe we might see more mycetoma cases more north or south of the mycetoma belt, which we didn't see before. For instance, in France, there are some autologous cases of human mycetoma, of actinomycetoma now, which were only discovered in the recent years and not previously. But still, still, those are very few cases. So I wouldn't dare to say if that was due to climate change or something else. Yeah. I think it's interesting because there's a lot of linkages to be made that will propel this upwards in the global health agenda. This climate change link is just one of them. Um, you know, it's very much a young person's kind of, uh, the momentum is with the young in that particular sector. And so I'm trying to swap that over to the question, flip the question over to Matt, uh, if that's okay to involve you a bit in this. Um, you know, we're talking about partnership bill, uh, we're talking about the global community. And in essence, it comes down to definitions. You've very eloquently, very beautifully shown the Seven Oaks um, engagement. Um, in your definition of global community, is that you're going to be 
pushing that, scaling that out to other schools? To, is that something you're going to be going along with, Matt? Yeah, that's the idea. Um, so right when I left <clears throat> Sydney, we uh, three of us got some money from from Google Australia to start that Breaking Good project, and the idea w was precisely to to try and scale that up a little bit. Um, and then came here, um, and Seven Oaks were were interested in in getting involved in some of this work, and so uh, so they led a, 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 an application for a little bit of money to the Royal Society for support. Um, and really, these are these are intended to be uh, pilots to sort of see what works. Um, I mean, we know it will work, but I guess you just got to, uh, the, the aim is to sort of generate a very easy to follow recipe for what you need. So if you want to do this, if you're a teacher in a school or if you're running a lab class in, in a university, you just need a kind of cheat sheet about the five things you've got to get set up, you know. So how, how do you, what, what lab notebook are you supposed to use? You know, uh, what happens to the samples? Who's going to test them? Um, what's the structure like, you know, if you need things done uh, on in, sort of analysis done, which the school can't do, uh, who could do that for you? What partnership is there with, a, with for example, a university? So it's, it's really just mapping all that out. Um, all of the other things are in place, really. Um, but, you know, I mean, the main thing is the enthusiasm of people to do stuff. Yeah. That's the that's the goal. Um, and, and so what you got to do is you know, direct that in, in, a, in a way that's productive. So, so really, it's more just this kind of recipe for, for how to do this, a cloning recipe of how to do it. And then I think we could do an awful lot there. I mean, I, you know, yeah. I sense there is a lot of enthusiasm for getting involved from lots of people. It's just that they, they don't know what, what to do that, that will be helpful. And they, yeah. you know, that, that it's really about that. So, um, so I, mean, I, like, I totally hear you there in terms of the energy that's out there and that can be harnessed. In the chat box, we've had uh, Dr. Olan Rewaju Comfort from the University of Abuja uh, in Nigeria. He's saying he wants to be involved, so you've got a fan there. And then kind of hopefully that translates into something moving downstream. But I'm sure the communication frames around that work, um, you know, need, really need to be set. And this is why we're talking about definitions when it comes to global community and partnership building. That is an untapped asset in terms of what you've shown in terms of the Seven Oaks project and all of this. So, you know, hats off to you uh, for that. And I'm really be fascinated to see how that kind of um, moves forward. Um, just coming back to some of those, well, some of the kind of gaps, uh, as it were. Ed, you had alluded to a gap in terms of global collection of strains. Um, from a typing perspective and a resistance study perspective, that there's a kind of a, 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 um, a challenge there um, in terms of sample collection, global collection of samples that can then be used for those studies. Have you considered or have you aware of the digital approaches to that? So that the, the find, we had a session with find diagnostics um, a few weeks ago, really, and it was looking at um, a virtual biobank uh, setting uh, that they just started. Uh, are you aware of that? Are you, is that something that this, this, this virtual approach, you think that could help this particular sample issue, collection issue? I'll think of all the two this one. Yeah, I'll, yeah, probably, yeah. Nicely battered. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, I do think that this well. virtual biobank will certainly help. Many of the tools uh, we have developed in our lab, uh, we have developed in vitro susceptibility tools, we have developed uh, molecular identification tools, but also molecular typing te uh, techniques are actually, um, they can be used in any lab. So you can actually share the data without us having to do all that ourselves. We can actually share our protocols and the labs can do it our, themselves. So for instance, the simple typing uh, method we use, it's, well, it's, uh, it is not that simple, but it uses uh, markers which you then translate into numbers. And these numbers you can share online and build yeah. trees from. Um, and it doesn't matter where you actually analyze your sample. So even if it's only a digital collaboration, it's still possible to build larger collection sets. Also with yeah. MIC testing, uh, we're using a standardized approach, which is easily to be learned. And I trained many students bachelor students as well in performing these essays so I can train everyone to perform such an essay and then that can be really sustainable so that could be done in the real regions themselves 
And that would actually uh, help us to identify more resistant isolates, more different isolates, and build a uh, biobank digitally as well. That's a fantastic answer, and thank you for that. And I'm sure we'll put the link up uh, when we edit this to the, to the, it's on our website as well, that particular session. We've had some, um, we've got loads of questions to ask you actually, but there are a lot of questions coming through from the audience. And because of time, I'm going to start weaving some of these in. So they're quite specific. So I'll start, actually, I'll start without the specific ones first. Um, so from uh, Dr. Selvi Subramaniam, um, and this is a question to everybody really, how much the how much awareness is there at public level in terms of the disease and the risks in terms of the mycetoma endemic countries and do you think the work that you're doing how could that input or well, the additional question is that how could your work impact in terms of raising public awareness we're talking about openness i'll ask i'll ask that to matt first actually how much do you think the public are aware in your opinion of this disease well, We're I trying mean, to bring everybody together. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not at all. I don't think. Um, I mean, it's certainly in this country, but but you know, more generally, whenever I give a talk about um, drug discovery and medicinal chemistry, um, you know, people know what fungal infections are, but no one's heard of mycetoma. Um, yeah. And and I mean, I guess it depends on your community, of course. You know, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm mostly talking to to chemistry and and, and molecular biology people, and, and never heard of it. Um, which, which is, I mean, yeah, everyone's busy, right? And everyone's got their own research interests, but it's, it's obviously a shame because it, it's, it's such an incredible disease. It maybe it's different in, in, for Wendy and Ed who, who talk to different communities, but yeah. I mean, just in terms of the general public, you know, if, you, if you're at the dinner table and you're talking to your family, no one's heard of it ever. Yeah, yeah, and that has to change. That has to change. So hopefully your work with Seven Oaks will develop a new kind of not just knowledge surface, but also potential champions in terms of advocacy uh, within this area. So that's a very interesting kind of offshoot of your work. I mean, that, that's very interesting indeed. We've got some specific questions here. So Dr. Sarah Mohammed uh, from the Ministry of Health Sudan is asking really a question around, I'm assuming, sensitivity and specificity thresholds for mycetoma uh, diagnostics. Um, I feel that to you, Wendy. Do you have any figures on that in, the, in, in some of the work that you're working on? Where have you reached? Well, in the TPP, some uh, sensitivity and uh, specificity profiles have been um, written down. Uh, the, the diagnostic tests currently available are not uh, that very far advanced that we have very large numbers and data sets. They have been tested mainly in Sudan where uh, the etiology is different than in other regions. So we don't have global numbers. It really depends on the situation where you are. We calculate sensitivity, specificity always when we develop a novel test, but it will be different if you uh, use it in a different situation. So if we uh, use a test developed for Marjorella in mycetoma uh, or in Sudan, then we will expect differences with uh, that in Mexico because simply Marjorella mycetomatis is not as prevalent in Mexico as it is in Sudan. So really we need a global uh, validation of all these assays to come up with real numbers. So hopefully everyone can input into this WHO process. Uh, you, you put the links up and hopefully that's a call to arms for that. Thank you very much for answering that. Um, another question that's come through here Again, it's really quite specific, but well, you may have partly answered that just then, but from Selvi again, um, she's saying brilliant talk and very informative presentation and that applies to all of the presentations. She's asking, besides drug treatment for mycetoma, are there any rapid diagnostic test kits that have been developed for preliminary screening of mycetoma infection? I know you'd put the poll question up in terms of what people are using, but in if you'd like to elaborate on that, when they didn't No, there are no uh, rapid point of care tests yet. Uh, the most rapid test available now is to isolate DNA from the grain, do a PCR, or uh, if you re only want to discriminate between bacteria and fungi, is to do a wet mount or a smear. Uh, but those are the most rapid tests at the moment. Uh, none of them are commercial. They are all in-house made. Um, so a real point of care test like we have for COVID, that's not there for uh, mycetoma. Fantastic. Thank you for that answer. And just on that, the poll results are there. 
Um, so what diagnostic technique can you, would you use to identify mycetoma, the causative agent in your lab? Uh, PCR, way ahead of everybody, 39%. Culture, 14%. Histology, 7 Direct Samir that you just mentioned, 17%. And this no identification methods, which is quite worrying, actually, 21%. So there is obviously a gap there. And I wonder, I was going to ask this, in terms of stigma, the stigmatization of these of patients and the psychosocial stigma that they have, there's quite disfiguring, hor horrifying photographs uh, of the patients uh, with, with, uh, who were affected that Ed had shown, actually, in his presentation. Do you think that comes into any of this? Are they willing to come forward for these direct sampling, does that have any kind of negative effect? Wendy or Ed, I mean, what, you know. Well, um, <clears throat> definitely, you know, this is a, a very debilitating uh, uh, condition which, which continues for months, if not years. And it has an effect on your physical well-being. It has uh, social effects because, you know, these are young people who drop out of school, they drop out of their peer uh, group, they cannot find a partner to marry. Um, they cannot find a job. Then, they, of course, they become depressed by this this terrible condition because sometimes they are able to access treatment and that is available for a short time, or it's not available, or they have to pay for it, and so so it is a dramatic. And believe it or not, uh, people come forward to. Professor Fahal's uh, L unit in Khartoum, and they are so fed up with this uh, mask on the limb that smells and that makes them outcast uh, yeah. that they ask for amputation. Uh, well, and, yeah. and then I think, you know, that we as a mycetoma community, the medical community, have failed to find adequate drug to treat this infection. It is an infection that should be treatable with drugs. And we are years and years behind the rest of other, uh, the other entities. So this is what we want to avoid. And we want to, to detect these patients early and treat them early and treat them early where they live uh, so that they do not have to come to the central level. I think this is the, the, big, the big challenge. Yeah, well, that's a great answer, Ed, and to involve the community in that is obviously uh, vital in all of that. So a great, great answer. Um, and, and thank you for that. They come, just coming to uh, Matt there for a second, there's a question again from Selvi asking really, saying open source and the asset is a great initiative, and it certainly is. Um, in the face of open asset sharing, will there be an underlying ethical question or issue? I think you alluded to some of that in terms of the open, uh, you know, the intellectual property straight jackets being off and all of this kind of stuff. But is, are there, is there any underlying ethical question that you could kind of, or issue that you that you kind of bring it's out? It's an interesting question. I'm not sure. Um, uh, I, I sh if there is one, I should be aware of it, but I'm not sure. sure. Um, there is, I mean, uh, I don't think so. No, not, not majorly. I, I think there is one thing um, about doing a project in the open. If you do something in the open, you do, um, you do sort of prevent anybody else from from patenting anything in that area so you you sort of carpet bomb the intellectual property uh, area around what you're doing because what everything you're doing is is freely available and you say what you're going to do so you you do prevent anyone else from from patenting so i think if you do something openly there is a sort of um there's a responsibility placed upon you to make sure that you do the best you can with the project and you don't just you know destroy all possible protection of ip and then leave you know, you, you've got to try and see it through to the end. Um, uh, but I, as far as I can tell, that's, there's other things, of course, to do with making sure that student progression and and career progression is maximized. And, and early on, that was an issue because, you know, were we were we messing around with with students ability to publish the work and therefore yeah. and therefore do well on their CVs? That's all gone, which is which is good because you can now do things in the public domain and publish it, no problem. But in the yeah. in the early years, that was an issue. You know, are we are the students going to suffer? But I, I, other than that, I don't think so. If there is one, I would love to know because I don't want to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm assuming that Selvi, you you kind of uh, you were talking about or, or anchoring some of that the ethical issues around the intellectual property rights. But I think Matt, you very you showed that in your. Uh, 
and your work, and certainly this new M4 ID project, Matt, it seems like an amazing uh, uh, way forward. We'd love to give that a bit more air maybe later on in the year. That's a fantastic um, uh, approach and, and uh, project. Um, we're coming towards the end. I'm beginning, I'm beginning a time kind of marker coming up on my uh, screen. We've got about five minutes left. I think it's a good, good time to ask the speakers, um, would the, what would be your final kind of message to the community out there uh, in terms of your particular one, like, and, and, you know, some of these long-term, mid-term, short-term gaps that Ed has mentioned, some of these issues that uh, the nuances uh, in terms of the, the, the developing the correct type of diagnostic, uh, sustainability was mentioned really by Wendy as well in terms of the point of care and, and, and Matt's obvious uh, uh, um, engagement there. What would be a final kind of message to the community out there? And I will start with um, Ed, actually. Why not? Well, you know, I, I can only quote, you know, the or tell you about the work that Fahal's group is doing in Sudan because they, they, they travel from the central level to the field and not once, but many, many times. And they, they contact local authorities at the, uh, at the level of the governor of the state. They contact the leaders in the various villages. They explain about mycotoma. They diagnose, treat mycotoma. They have public health educations, education. And that creates great awareness among the people to come forward at an early stage and not wait until you get these, these grotesque lesions that are so debilitating. So, you, we must reach out to the field, and I think what Files Group is doing is is, is really the way forward. Um, and mind you, these these endemic areas, these people live far away from the central level. You travel, you travel at least a day, if not more, to reach them. And I think this uh, this has to be done. We need to provide uh, access and to diagnostics and access to treatment, and hopefully treatment that is uh, uh, better than what we have now. Uh, fantastic answer um, and final statement there by Ed. Thank you. Um, Wendy, for you, I mean, we've, we've heard, you know, that scabies, yours, and we just heard probably the potential role of these community health workers potentially to reaching out to these communities and bringing them in. Is that an asset that you'd like to reach out to in terms of a message to that? You know, we're moving towards integration. What would you say to that, to those kind of... Uh, yeah, I would think that uh, integration will really be helpful and will really identify more mycotoma patients as we do know now. Uh, but I think this integration should be global. So we should not only focus on those areas where we already know that mycotoma is prevalent. We should also focus on those areas where we could predict that mycotoma is prevalent, but nobody has been reporting it yet. We do, that as, we do know that there should be a lot more mycetoma out there. And those patients have not been reached. We don't know how extensive, how many cases there are, what the nature of the uh, lesions is, what the causative agents are. And that is all information people need to know before we can actually reach out to, to those patients, diagnose them and treat them. So there, the integrated approach, I think, will will certainly be very helpful because there are programs in these areas for other skin entities. And if they could tag along mycetoma, if they know about mycetoma, that will certainly help those individuals in th those regions. Yeah, and there's, that's a great answer. There's a skin app, InfoLab people have made it in the Netherlands, and we've given them a recognition award at our science and communications festival that we run every year. And they'd, they'd uh, agreed to add mycetoma to that app as well. So we probably, if you're not aware of it, we'd definitely send a link over, but you're probably already aware of it. But that type of integration, absolutely and a wonderful answer. Um, Matt, in terms of we've heard your uh, uh, amazing work with schools, and frankly, I, I say amazing, I'm not using that word lightly. It really is future-proofing this whole kind of move of drug discovery in, in one way. Um, and, and by engaging with the, with the younger kind of audience who are so much more savvy when it comes to all of these platforms that you've mentioned and talked about, uh, GitHub and the, the power of those platforms. I'd come out of that for a second and ask you, what would be your message to pharma, if you don't mind me asking, ESI are involved, what would be your message there? Oh, pharma are, are fantastic partners in all of this. I mean, that's the thing. So the, the pharmaceutical companies are just full of people who just want to help. Um, and, and we have the most productive interactions with the pharma companies. They they can't do certain things because 
the way they're put together, they they have to make a profit, right? They contractually obliged to make a profit yeah. but yeah. the number of scientists with with immense amounts of expertise who help out in projects like this is just sensational I mean, it keeps happening so yeah a, a key part of the open side of things is is um contributions and involvement from pharma no question that's a fantastic answer I completely agree with you someone has to pay for this right so it can't just be the prv you know that it just can't be the proprietary review voucher it's got to be more than that so absolutely um a great answer um some of the audience uh, comments on this, uh, Dr. Sajida Riaz from Pakistan, very informative. Dr. Mercy Mumo, very informative session. Professor Jonathan Steinhorst, thank you for the interesting presentations. Uh, Muhammad Habib uh, Gemli, uh, Dr. Muhammad Habib Gemli from the Institute Pasteur Tunisia. Thank you to all the speakers and the organizers of this webinar. Dr. Guzani from the Institute Pasteur Tunisia, brilliant approach. You had the interest from Dr. Olan Rewaju Comfort from the University of Abuja in, in Nigeria. Potentially that could uh, lead to something, I hope so. Um, you know, some great kind of, you know, thanks and, and, uh, and everything uh, there. So I think you really hit a big nerve there. And hopefully this session has helped in a tiny way, in a, in a good way, to move mycetoma up the kind of um, global health agenda, as it were. Um, I'd like to say thank you very, very much to all of you, for, to Ed, to Wendy, and to Matt for making time. Um, you know, we, it, it all came together at the end. And I think Twitter's going, if you're not, if you didn't realize, the Twitter feeds are going pretty ballistic at the moment <laughs> in terms of some of the snippets and the sound bites from, from your uh, talking. So, you know, thank you very much to everybody. Uh, who has been uh, on Twitter doing that. We've been putting out uh, stuff ourselves. We, so thank you to the team for doing that as well. Uh, so that's all good. So please check out that at ISNTD Press. Uh, finally, Paul McKeating from Seven Oaks, thank you for this. The students enjoyed it and found it very informative. So there we go. It's all, all the boxes are ticked. Um, thank you for joining us, uh, Mr. McKeating. If you say Paul in front of your students, Mr. McKeating. Um, brilliant. Thank you all. Thank you all very, very much. And um, I hate saying goodbye, but good, uh, you know, until next time. <laughs> I'm not good at saying goodbye. So, yeah, everybody take care. Keep safe. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye bye. See you. Bye. bye, -bye.